Welcome to this video. Um, this is a recording for what I had originally intended to cover in class on Tuesday, January 29th. Now, uh, what happened was Tuesday the 29th ended up being the first day of class, so we went over the syllabus and kind of got our feet wet with a little bit about what linear algebra was about. Um, that was this thing about uh, calories and protein and this kind of thing related to peas and uh, mushrooms. And with that sort of introductory kind of problem out of the way, it will come up again actually in this lecture, um, in this video lecture, but here we are um, doing what would have been the second full day of class. So this is meant to replace, I guess at this point, Wednesday's class due to Wednesday being canceled. In any case, it would be nice to um, kind of go through this. This is meant for the second physical day that we would have met, but um, due to the number of cancellations, I thought it would be nice if you would watch this before the next time we meet. So this is meant to cover some of the key ideas of section 1.1, systems of linear equations. Um, I was intending to have one of these uh, questions using the, the um, clickers thing that you had. Um, this was going to be true or false. If the number of equations is more than the number of variables in a system of linear equations, then the system must have no solution. And um, well, you see an arrow giving way that this was false. Um, actually, yesterday we had an example. Uh, at the end, you recall there were these question number three, question number four were sort of backwards from the way uh, questions one and two were worded. and. Um, there were three equations to unknowns, and the first of these, so question number three had a solution, the, the, the second of these, this was question number four, did not have a solution. Um, I just want to kind of remind you of an idea that I sort of brought up in class, which is that it is going to be important to pay attention to the theory. Um, it has very practical applications, and the theory in this class is uh, rather different from how things work out in calculus, but I, I hope you, you grow to like it. So I am right now using um, Adobe Acrobat Reader to just kind of scroll through the PDF of my notes. Um, I can post the PDF of this as well. So first off, just to make sure we're on the same page, definition, a linear equation is an equation that can be written in the form a1 times x1 plus a2 times x2 plus dot dot dot. Follow that pattern until you get to a sub n times x sub n is equal to b, um, where just the intent here is that a1, a2, all the way up to a sub n. So those are n numbers, typically real numbers, sometimes complex numbers, and b is also a real or a complex number. We'll typically stick to real numbers, right? So n is the number of variables, so you see a term you see a second term. There's lots of dots here to say, you know, keep going. There's an a sub 3 times x sub 3, so on and so forth, until you finally get to a sub n times x sub n. And um, if you have three or fewer variables, then often we'll just use x1, replace that with just x, and x2 we'll just call it y, and x3 we'll just often call z for convenience if there's three or fewer variables. So let's take a look here. I was going to have you get in groups and answer of these six labeled equations here, which of these are linear and which are nonlinear. So if you'd like to pause the video, so that uh, I'm about to give it away, but if you'd like to pause the video, just identify which are linear, which are nonlinear. So scrolling down here um, in my notes, uh, two, four, and five are the linear equations. So let's go through the, the nonlinear ones and talk about why they're not. So equation number one here is nonlinear because of this y to the second power. So y squared considered too hard for what we're doing, right? That's going to be some kind of parabola shape type thing. We're not dealing with that in this class, okay? This is a linear algebra. Um, equation number three is not linear because you have x to the one half power. That's what this root x is. So we don't deal with square roots either. That's sort of the same problem that squaring is. And then uh, equation number six is also not linear because you have x times y. So we're not going to multiply a variable. Same, oh, same issue here, x times z. Oh, okay, actually here, 2y times z. So you see the same problem three times here. We're not going to multiply one variable by another. That's considered too hard for linear algebra. It's not a thing we're going to deal with. Um, how to test sort of going the other way. How about you write a, an equation that's linear in the variables x1 through x4, and then write a nonlinear equation. Here's an example of a linear equation. Uh, 8 times x1 plus negative 9 times x2 plus 0 times x3 plus 6 times x4 is equal to 2. I, you didn't pick any other numbers. You didn't have to pick 8 or negative 9 or whatever. And you, this could also be written this way, you know, just having a minus sign instead, skipping the term that's going to be 0 anyway. And if you want, subtract 2 on both sides, so you have a 0 on the right side. Um, in linear algebra, it's essential to look at every possible geometric view of each of the algebra problems we look at. So in calc, in calculus, you can kind of get by without thinking too much about geometry. That's not going to really work in a linear algebra class. We do need to look at the geometry of what's going on in linear equations. So that's the question I want to consider. What does a plot of the solution set 
of a linear equation even look like? When you look at all solutions of a linear equation, what does this look like? So this is the task. I was going to have you do this in groups, you know, just with a neighbor right next to you. So um, write a linear equation in two variables, right? So stick with n is equal to 2, n is the number of variables. Just don't pick 3x plus 4y equals 5 only because I picked that one. So pick a different one, right? Like a number, choose a number times x plus choose a number times y is equal to choose a number. And then plot the set of all points in the xy plane which satisfy the equation that you've created. Compare with another group, conjecture what shape you get. So this is a good place to pause the video. Okay, um, if you have now unpaused, welcome back. And you know, just like what kind of shapes should you get out of this process? Well, with one exception, what you should end up getting is a line, right? So typically for any choices of A1, A2, and B, you're gonna get a line. There's one time that you're not, and that's if A1 and A2 are both equal to zero, then you'll get something else. And why don't you think about what you're gonna get? But most of the time, you're gonna get a line. So if your conjecture for the shape was a line, this is good, right? Line, already putting the linear in linear algebra. And what about if n is equal to three? Right? So we're looking here, n is equal to 2, so there's a variable called x and a variable called y. And just to switch it up now, instead of using x, y, z, I'm calling the variables x1, x2, x3. But if you'd like, you could call them x, y, and z as well. So what happens when you graph, uh, what kind of shape do you get in three-dimensional space when you graph all the points satisfying 4x plus 5, y plus 6, z is equal to 7? What shape is that? It comes from calc 2. That is going to be the shape of a plane. Right. So generally speaking, with one exception, uh, what you're going to get for something that looks like this, as long as a1, a2, a3, and b are fixed numbers, fixed real numbers, uh, what you're going to get is the shape of a plane. That's if n is equal to 3. I, I would challenge you to think about what you're going to get in four-dimensional space. So think about this at home, right? So not in in-class activity at this moment, but like, what about 5x1 minus 6x2 plus 7x3 plus 8x4 is equal to, well, another number, pi, right? What's that going to look like? What, what will that be if you graph this in four-dimensional space? That's kind of tough to do, I get, but like, see if you can get hints from what's going on using some information from the lower dimensional the, the examples that we're looking at. And the main um, object of study in this section is a system of linear equations, which we will just for short often call a linear system. This is just one or more linear equations in the same variables. Okay, so we had an example uh, yesterday. So um, just for today. Uh, it, uh, I'm numbering, numbering the examples because we're going to keep referring back to them. Um, but So here's a system of linear equations, right? This is the example we, in fact, looked at on the first class day that we had. There's a linear equation. Here's a second linear equation. Here's a third linear equation. And they need to be in the same variable. So this is the same x that's here, there, and there. And the same y is here, there, and there. And so this is a linear system, just using the other language that's up here in the three linear equations. So sorry, excuse me. This is a linear system that has three linear equations, and it is in two variables. The variables are x and y. Those are the two variables. And we saw yesterday that there is a solution to this system, and it is that x, y, it's the point in, in two-dimensional space. It, the, the solution is uh, the point 5, comma 2. Right? So this is considered one solution, not two. In other words, x equals 5 alone is not a solution. You need the x value of 5, the y value to be 2. And we have what's called a simultaneous solution, meaning that you need to use the same number 5 here, there, and there, and the same value of y here, here, and there to satisfy all three equations all at the same time. OK, this was the peas and mushrooms example yesterday. Here's a second example of a system of linear equations. That doesn't look quite right because you've got this over here on this side, but you could subtract 3x two and subtract six x three on both sides of the first equation. The, the second equation is already kind of written in the right format. The third equation, again, you know, maybe would subtract that on both sides so that you just have a constants. You could have a constant of two for the middle equation, constant negative seven. And I guess even if you subtract seven on both sides, you'd have a constant of seven on the right. Excuse me, constant of negative second, seven, negative seven on the right side of the first equation once rewritten. But this is a linear system with three equations in three variables. You count them up. The last variable is x sub 3, right? There's no x sub 4 present or anything like that. OK, so I have these. Uh, I wrote this here as a note to myself to remind you all in class that uh, the number of equations you have does not have to match the number of variables. Now, it's also allowed to, right? So this is our example with three equations, three variables. Here's an example with three equations with just two variables. Here's example number three. 
Uh, this is a system of linear equations with two equations, two linear equations. There's the first one, there's the second one. Two variables, so variable x1, variable x2. This is kind of written in a fairly standard form with the variable stuff over here on the left side, and after the equals on the right side, you have these constants. This is sort of a nice format, and we'll use that a lot. This is the same example down here. It's just um, there's a lazier notation. Instead of using x sub 1, we're just calling it x, and instead of saying this is x sub 2, we'll call that y. And, you know, it makes sense to do when you only have variables x1, x2, x3 to use x, y, z. But once you have more variables than that, you start to run out of letters. And that's when, if you have like 10 variables, it's kind of helpful to have x1, x2, x3, all the way up to x sub 10. A solution of a system of linear equations um, is an ordered list of numbers. So uh, s1 all the way up to s of n, which makes each equation satisfied when the numbers s1, s2, and so on are su substituted for x1, x2, and so on. So for instance, if we go back to uh, this example right here, example number three, so three comma seven is not a solution of the first system. So it turns out that three seven, you plug that in for x and y, that works for the first equation, first equation is satisfied, the second equation here is not satisfied, you can check. However, two three is a solution of this system right here. So you plug in two for every x, three for every y, and both equations are satisfied. Here's a picture uh, on the next page of this PDF. There's a page break. Um, so this 4x minus y equals 5, x plus 3y equals 11. Here's a picture of that, right? So we've got the axes first, and then there's one of the equations. There's the other equation. So over here is 3, 7. That was mentioned as not a solution of the system. I mean, one of the equations is satisfied, but the other equation doesn't satis is not satisfied with that point, right? 2, 3 is the only s solution. It works. It's a point that's on both of the lines. And that's the picture. Nice geometry. Um, if we looked at example 4 here, 3x minus 6y equals 9, negative 5x plus 10y equals negative 15, uh, find a solution to this system. So again, you need to find a solution. You need both an x and a y value that work for both equations at the same time. And it turns out that there's lots of solutions. Any of these are there's infinitely many solutions. These are not the only. There's more than that, and that's because though there were two equations presented, the first equation was this line. The second equation is actually an equation for the same line. Right? You can get from one equation to the other uh, simply by let's see. What do you need to do? Take this first equation. Excuse me. Multiply both sides by I guess negative five thirds, and you get from one equation to the other. Right. So these two lines are the same line really. There's infinitely many solutions. And one way to describe the set of solutions is to write something like this. Now this set notation, uh, you're, we're going to be seeing a lot of this, so let's talk about how to read this. You will be expected to write things that look like this, so why don't we talk about this. A set is typically going to be written with curly braces, so there's a left curly brace, right curly brace. There's a colon or a vertical bar here in the middle. Um, and how you read this is read the second part after the colon first. So it says, it says as you run through each real, so this means the set of real numbers, if you pick t to be any element or any member of the real, so t is any real number, as you run through all the possible real numbers you can, think of any real number, plug that in for t here and there, and then a point or a vector that looks like this with two entries, there's the first coordinate, there's a second coordinate, t, anything that looks like that is going to be um, one of the solutions, and all the solutions all together are stored in a set like this. So the set of all possible definition, the set of all solutions, possible solutions, is called the solution set. So 3 comma 0 is in the solution set because 3 comma 0 is a solution. That's what you get if you plugged in. If you chose, again, I said that you, know, you can pick any real number you want for t. So if you pick t as 0 right here, then you could compute that 3 plus 2 times 0 is equal to 3. And if you pick t to be 1 instead, then this spot here would be a 1. That's right there. But if you pick t to be 1, then you have 3 plus 2 times 1. So that's why there's a 5 here. So 5 comma 1, check that out. That's also another point that's on this line is a solution to both of these equations over here. So uh, what about this next one? Um, example 5, try this on your own. What's the solution set of this equation, that equation? Right. So system of linear equations. You have two equations, two unknowns. It turns out there is no solution here. And let's say the same thing geometrically. So you could have done this by substitution. That's fine if you did something like that. 
right? Um, you might have ended up with something like uh, 14 equals 19 and said, well, there's no way that that's satisfied. But these turn out to be two parallel lines if you plot them. Two parallel lines that don't intersect at all. So it's not like the previous example where we had two parallel lines, but they were the same line. These are two different parallel lines. They never touch each other. They don't intersect. They never intersect, so there's no solution. A theorem four um, on page, sorry, theorem. There's a theorem on page four of the book, and it says, it states the following fact. It says that a system of linear equations has no solution, or exactly one solution, or infinitely many solutions. These are the only possibilities. We will actually prove this theorem later on in the semester. We don't have the machinery to do this now, but we will um, go through the work, and I, I hope that you'll be thoroughly convinced that this is the case. What I'm saying is, you can have a system of linear equations with no solution. In fact, that's we see this example. You can have exactly one solution. If I scroll back, sorry to do this, uh, there's this is the case of one solution. And of course, we also saw the situation of infinitely many solutions. That was two lines that were right on top. I mean, they were the same line, right? One line right on top of each other. Now, you see all th three of these. You've seen examples of all three of these possibilities. So you might feel convinced of this theorem already. But it's, this theorem is not so much about these three things as, as the fact that nothing else is possible. That's the surprising thing. If you have a system of linear equations, you cannot have just two solutions. Isn't that bizarre? You cannot, if you have a system of linear equations, you can't have just three solutions or just eight solutions. You can have just one solution. Just one solution is fine. That's okay. You can't have two solutions. That's why I kind of way back, I was trying to mention that, you know, uh, uh, I'll scroll back. Sorry to do that. I was mentioning that uh, this here, right here, is considered one solution, not two solutions, right? So there's, yeah, there's an x value and a y value, but this point, this single point, this one dot on the xy plane is considered one solution. That's bizarre, I think, right? That you can have no solutions, you can have one solution, but you can't have two solutions. You can't have three solutions. You can't have eight solutions. You can have infinitely many solutions. You just, you know, if somebody walked down the street and told me, I have a system of linear equations, and I know it has seven solutions, I would tell them, I'm sorry, but you're not correct. I don't know what your system of linear equations is, but it can't have just seven solutions. And that's surprising. So we will prove that at some point. Here's a definition. A uh, system of linear equations is inconsistent if it has no solution. Let's pause there for a second. I wrote here, why singular? So it, it's if it, not if they have. It's if it has, not if they have. And it's it because the word it here is referring to the word system, even though the system has many equations, plural, right? I know this sounds really weird, but, but it's gonna be important to get into this grammar. So a system of linear equations has many equations. You know, one equation is possible, two, three, four, ten equations. You know, more than one equation is typical to say that you have a system. But the system, once you've collected all the equations together into one pot, right, into one bag, that system is one bag now, right? Like there's one, th that's one thing, and that's why it's it. It is referring to the system. So, and then otherwise the system is consistent if there is a solution, if there's one or more solutions. So geometrically, uh, let us, here's the question. Let's just geometrically describe the solution set of this system of linear equations. What ends up occurring here is if we describe this in words, it's hard to draw. So when we're in three-dimensional space, R3 here, and you've got one plane. We, we just described that that was a plane. Here's another plane. And you know what? Back from Calc 2, these two planes are not parallel because look, the normal vector here is 3, 4, negative 5, and the normal vector of this other plane is 2, 0, 1. All right, so these are two non-parallel planes, and so they're going to intersect. And think of how two planes are going to intersect if they're not parallel, they'll intersect in the shape of a line. So the comment to make here is that since a line has infinitely many points, this is a linear system of this third type right here, has infinitely many solutions. Okay, so uh, we typically will rewrite 
uh, equations in a certain order. So if we go back to example number two, what we'll do is put all of the variable stuff on the left side, put the constant on the right side. It's just a matter of, you know, adding and subtracting on both sides. Of course, for sanity, we'll just like, you know, put the variables in numerical order, x sub one, then x sub two, x sub three. And notice like this middle equation from the, the second example didn't have an x sub one thing. That's fine. So we just kind of align the x two stuff all in one nice neat column like this. And one thing that we'll do, is take all of the numbers that appear over here to the left of the equal sign, once we've organized like this, and write them in a matrix like this. So take a look, the zero is here because of the absence of something here. The one is because of the hidden one in front of x sub one here, right? This one is for this x, the one in front of the x sub two. So I, I think you see where these numbers come from. And this is the first matrix we're introducing. This is called the coefficient matrix. So a, a system of linear equations like this, here's a coefficient matrix. And if you have a system of linear equations with m equations in n variables, then this coefficient matrix, the size of the matrix is m by n. So m is the number of rows, right? The number of rows ends up being the number of equations here. And then the number of columns is the number of variables that you have. So earlier we used n for the number of variables, and n matches here, it, it is intentionally the same n, it's the number of columns. And we always, always follow this convention to write the size of a matrix as the number of rows first, then followed by the number of columns next. There is, for this inf information here, that we're missing this data of the negative seven, the two, the negative seven, and that information can be written in as well. So if you take this coefficient matrix earlier, you can draw a vertical line um, and then write those numbers, I'll scroll up again, negative two, sorry, negative seven, two, negative seven, you can write those right here. And drawing this vertical line, it can be drawn solid, it can be drawn dashed, or it could be not drawn at all. You'll see different conventions and different things that you look at on, uh, sometimes it's helpful to draw it in, but you don't have to, right? When you include the numbers that were on the right side over here, then this is called an augmented matrix, right? So let's take a look at the difference between the coefficient matrix and the augmented matrix. The augmented matrix has an additional column right here. These are the numbers from the right side, the constants. If you chop this information off, you get, of course, back to the coefficient matrix. So uh, the business for section 1.2, which we are just gonna preview in this lecture, is um, how do you take this information and solve a system of linear equations. Now, of course, you can do the by substitution thing that you learned in a previous algebra class. Now, that's totally going to work. But once there's lots of rows and lots of columns, that can get really tedious to write all that information out. So what we're about to do here, these three elementary row operations, this is the bread and butter of our computation. It is, it is once you get going, it's really not so bad. It can be a little tedious, to, if I'm really honest. But once you, once you, you know, just do this some, some number of times, get used to it, it's, it's not too bad, right? This is really, to be honest, the toughest computation we do. And all this is, is just, we'll kind of go through these step by step here. Um, and we, we'll, we'll try it on, on this example. But I want you to challenge yourself to think about how each of these processes that we're about to describe is something that you can, if you take what information is stored here, these are again just, it's these numbers all came from the three linear equations, <coughs> excuse me. And think about how these are all things that are reasonable to do, um, just if you take it back to the land of the algebra that it originally came from, right? So one, one of the elementary row operations is to replace one row by adding it, the entries of that row, to, the, to a multiple of another row. And you know, the, this is, just think about how that, that's okay to do when you know, we can add equations together is basically what this is amounting to. Interchange two rows, all that's doing is presenting the equation, the original linear equations in a different order. Like that's not really changing anything. And then finally, you could multiply all entries in a row by non-zero constant. That's if you multiplied both sides of an equation by that constant, right, by the same number. And you know, and then on one side distributed, that, that's all that's going on. These are uh, totally reasonable things to do um, as far as when you think of what information is happening when you translate it back to the original linear equations for your system, these seem very reasonable to do. It just turns out that if you do these operations in a certain order, you end up with a nicer form of this information. And that's what we're about to do. So the next class and the class after talk about how do you do this in a very nice format. Right now, 
try not to stress about like how did we know what steps to do? Let's just do the steps and see what occurs, right? So let's try these out. And what I'd like to do in terms of organization is I've recopied, I copy pasted that, that augmented matrix here. And here was the system of linear equations that we had. And what, what I'd like to do is say, let's try this. So let's take this row three here and we're gonna make a new row three. What's the new row three? Well, take the old row three. You take this two, negative three, negative five, and let's take row one and first multiply it by negative two, right? So what I'm saying is in this spot right here where the two was, instead of a two, we're gonna take the two that was there before, but add to it, we're gonna add negative two times this number. And that's, what, so what's gonna be here is two plus negative two times one, which of course is gonna be zero, right? So let's, that's what's right here, right? Um, just to make sure, I believe, if I have not made a mistake, that negative three, that's the number in row three, plus negative two times negative three should equal uh, positive three. Yeah, so negative three plus, let's see, negative two times negative three is positive six, right? So negative three plus six is positive three. I'll be really honest, it's so easy to like add numbers when you're supposed to subtract like it's keeping track of minus signs is the hardest thing about this process okay um, let's see so then negative 5 right there plus negative 2 times um, the row 1 entry is here negative 6 that should produce this number 7 and then we do the same thing over on the right side as well so take the negative 7 that's here that's the row 3 number we're gonna add to that negative 2 times uh, the row 1 number times negative 7 and when we do that we should get the number positive 7 so this matrix, the row one, row two stayed the same, but row three has changed. There's a new row three. What we have done is we took the old row three and added to the, the numbers here. We added negative two times each of these numbers there, and we got this matrix right there. Make sure that that makes sense. And what goes here? What goes here should be um, the equations uh, x1 minus 3x2 minus 6x3 equals negative 7. x2 plus 2x3 equals 2. That's all the same as before, but now this third equation is not this one. We have a new third equation, and it is 3x2 plus 7x3 equals 7. Now I'd like to try another one of these operations, is you can swap two rows. I mean, it doesn't really change much, but I thought, let's just do it. Just to, so this one's, there's not much to describe. Take a look at this augmented matrix. Take a look at this augmented matrix. And you see that uh, not, not much happened, right? Uh, just swapping of rows. And you can think about what goes here. It's just the three equations that were presented up here. Uh, leave the first equation alone, but just change the order of the two, the next two equations are written in. Now let's scale the third row by a factor of three. Now, this is not the only way to do this. There's a faster way, in fact, to do what we're about to do, but let's just to try it out. <clears throat> let's go through, scroll back here, try this third operation. Multiply all entries in a row by non-zero constant. So I'd like to take this third row and just multiply every number by three. So zero times three is zero, zero uh, one times three is three, two times three is six, and two times three is six. That's it, right? And then let's do the following is we'll make a new row three by starting with row three and we, we have to add a multiple of another row. So the, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add negative one times a row. And because we're adding negative one times a row, it's easy to phrase this as the new row three is the old row three minus row two. So think of doing this number minus this number and storing it in the third row, right? So zero minus zero is zero. Three minus zero will store a zero here. 6 minus 7 will store a negative 1 in this spot. 6 minus 7 will store a negative 1 in this spot. And I, I'll do that on the next page. And that's, then you get a thing that looks like this. Here's the corresponding new system of linear equations. And there's something special about this shape in that there's a number in this spot, that spot, that spot, but then below what's, this is called the diagonal. And below that spot, what you have are zeros. And if you look at this shape right here, you see that due to the presence of these zeros, you have zeros along here. Now take a look. Take a look at this tri what's called a triangular system due to this triangle shape right there. You can do this thing called back substitution, and it's actually now really nice to go back and solve 
take start with the equation where there's only one variable, right? Start with negative x3 is equal to negative 1. Right here. Boom. Solve for x sub 3. What do you do? Multiply both sides by negative 1. x sub 3 is 1. Done. Now that we know that x sub 3 is 1, take a look at this next equation. 3x2 plus 7x3 equals 7. All you got to do is plug in. We already know that x3 has to simultaneously solve all of the equations. So take that equation, plug in the x sub 3 that we know is 1 right there, and now take a look. How easy is it to solve 3x2 plus 7 times 1 equals 7? You know, subtract 7 on both sides, divide both sides by 3, boom, we just see that x sub 2 is equal to 0. And now that we know the numerical value of x3 is 1, we know the numerical value of x2 is 0, all you got to do is plug you know, in the zero here, plug in the, the, the positive one right there into this first equation, the one with the most number of variables. We just plug in, simplify, what, add six to both sides, and get x sub one is equal to negative one. And so you find out here that the only solution to this equation is uh, negative one for the first, for x sub one, zero for x sub two, and one for x sub three. So we'll, uh, th that's it. I mean, that's the process, and the questions you might have are, yeah, well, how did you know of these elementary row operations, which ones to do in which order, right? Like that, that is sort of the remaining question. How do you do this systematically? And that is the purpose of section 1.2.